Just because you know the guy personally doesn't mean you should trust them with your money. Welcome to the Let's Talk Business Podcast, a project of the Ptex Group. Gain valuable, actionable ideas from the world's top business leaders to help you take the next step in your business journey. And now, here is your host, Manny Hoffman. Coming to you from the PTS headquarters in Brooklyn, New York, this is the podcast for no-nonsense advice to help you learn, grow, and lead. Today, I'm so excited to welcome back my good friend and past guest of the Let's Talk Business podcast, Naftali Horowitz. Naftali Horowitz is a managing director and financial advisor at J.P. Morgan and author of the best-selling book, You Revealed. As a managing director of the nation's largest investment bank, Naftali has learned a lot about the nature of success. He's also a man with a mission to help guide Jews to a greater understanding of themselves, their challenges, and their hidden potential, both in face-to-face meetings and in popular lectures across the world. In our interview, we discuss many important topics. First, we speak about the important not to sell yourself without bashing your competition. As you work for your business, understanding bring real value to your business instead of bashing the competition. Number two, we discuss how a person really knows what their full potential is, and knowing that you are on the right track. It's so important to understand your full potential and being on the right track. We also discuss finding and achieving true fulfillment in life. Every person needs to feel fulfilled and how you could find true fulfillment. And last and most important, the importance of gratitude for your happiness. This and so much more only on the Let's Talk Business podcast. Let's get right to our conversation with Naftali Horowitz. Reb Naftali Harwitz, thank you so much for joining me on the Let's Talk Business podcast. My pleasure, Manny. So not a lot of people that were a guest on the show come back on the show. I think it's the second time we're doing that. Um, and this is uh, strictly straight up from the requests from people that are listening to the show regularly. He said, you know what, I think there's, you had him on so, so long ago that it's time to bring him back because so many things change in society and stuff like that. And, and people are more healthier for knowledge and so on and so forth. So thank you so much for making the time and your busy schedule. My pleasure. So I want to start first, obviously your background is, 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 uh, you know, wealth management and, and we, we're living now in a little bit of a downturn market in general. And yes, we had some bumps in the roads and the, 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 you know, the, the, the economy is always a cycle. We had a lot of people that had a lot of money and unfortunately they're finding themselves that, they don't have the money that they, they, they had in the past. We have people living paycheck to paycheck. What is stuff that you would say to your neighbor's kid that's starting off and having his first job and maybe making a little bit more than he needs to live? What would those be the do's and don'ts for somebody when it comes to managing their the money that the, the income? So we are we are living in a little bit of a downturn for some people. For some people, it's a, a big upturn. In my business, this is a we have a fantastic market right now. You know, there's a little a little bit of a disconnect between the stock market performance and what the average person is experiencing, especially at the cash register. Um, and then there are areas like real estate and other areas that are interest rate driven um, that are really suffering right now. So, you know, as what I say to young people is soak this all up because this is normal. Um, cycles are normal and you know just like in the stock market when the market goes down it's hard to imagine that it'll ever go up and when it goes up it's hard to imagine it'll ever go down the same is true with earnings Um, people you know people project into the future that whatever's happening today whether that's bad things will never get better and they kind of lose hope and then people that are doing very well as they did the last three or four years just think that the good times will continue, continue to roll. And then they find themselves in a downward cycle and they are in debt. They, they haven't accumulated any wealth whatsoever. Many people are coming to me today who are making million dollars or more over the last five years. And now they are literally earning nothing because they were in real estate or other things like that. And surprisingly, they haven't saved any money. They don't have a year or two's worth of money saved up to get them through this period. So the answer is cycles are part of they're part of life. And the economy is 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 a little bit of a roller coaster. 
And I've learned that even when it's down, it will come back up. And when it's up, it will come back down. So we need to really think about that and be very, very humble in spending money that we don't need to, even when things are good. And then the second thing is, is that it's very difficult to go backwards. Once you inflate your standard of living, once you accelerate your spending, once you get used to certain things, it's very, very hard to go back. And I always tell people, even if you think things are going to continue, and even if there's a reasonable belief that they will, just realize that if you ever had to downscale, if you ever had to pull back on your spending, the the shame and the pain of having to pull back is going to far outweigh the pleasure that you may be getting for this quick moment when you upgrade. So people that are taking car leases, people that are buying homes and mortgages and but overextending themselves, people that are buying things that they don't absolutely need, especially ones that are going to have ongoing maintenance costs. You really want to think about what happens if, God forbid, things turn back. What happens if I need to unload this asset? What if this, what the bank takes away this asset? What's if my car gets repossessed? Um, you know, cause there's no guarantee that you're not going to have to go backwards. So it's best to be very hesitant before you go forward and accelerate your spending. What would be a healthy balance? So obviously, um, people always, you know, on the flip side of this, what you just said, they say, if I'm making money, I want to enjoy life. I want to use it to things that bring me pleasure and enjoyment. So what is a healthy balance on that? So you have to be realistic with yourself. I mean, look, in, a lot of people say this to me. I have a relative who made a few dollars two years ago, pulled up here in a car that costs $1,400 to lease. And I said to him, what are you doing with this car? And he goes, I want to enjoy life. I want to enjoy life. So yeah, you want to enjoy life. I understand that. But, you know, you have to realize that enjoying life today, unless you are wealthy, is going to mean enjoying life less at some point in the future. So there's always two sides to the coin. What will give you more enjoyment? The three years that you have this car and probably the thrill of it wearing off after three or four months and then it's just another car or turning around 25, 30 years from now and having potentially a million dollars in an IRA or an account that you wouldn't have had otherwise, and all the while knowing that you did the right and disciplined thing. So I think people have to refine their taste for where they receive their enjoyment and what's the definition of enjoyment. When you're a child, an ice cream cone is enjoyable. When you get a little bit older, maybe it's a pair of rollerblades. And then when you get married and you start becoming responsible, fiscally responsible and responsible to your children and your future, I think you have to uh, sort of refine your taste for enjoyment. So I tell people I enjoy buying assets. I enjoy watching my assets grow. I enjoy doing responsible things for my with my money. I enjoy giving charity. I found that the shallowness of that quick enjoyment of everybody turning their heads when I drive down the street because I'm the first one to have a certain car. And then three months later, everybody has the same car. I, I kind of find that childish at this point. And again, you want to enjoy life, pick your enjoyment. There are really, really good ways to enjoy life that are far more responsible than blowing all the money you earn. But that doesn't mean that you can't enjoy life to some degree. Again, you have to have a list of priorities. Priority one is you better be putting money away. You better have enough money put away each year so that one day you don't wake up at 65 or 70 and say, oh, no, how am I going to retire? So you better start thinking about retirement the day you go out to work because that's that's the right way to do it. Playing catch-up late is going to be very, very difficult. So after you've done everything that's responsible – now you have choices. You want to go out and enjoy yourself. You want to spend twenty five, thirty thousand dollars on a vacation. That's your choice. If you want to save it up so you can invest in a piece of real estate at some point, that's your choice. I prefer the latter, but if somebody wants to do the former, that's up to them as long as they did everything that was responsible up until that point. So this is very valuable and it's also very important and true because 
you know, you could do way more things when you save that money because now you have the money to spend, then you, you, you know, you spent it all out and now you don't have choices because it's gone. Correct. I guess I, I want to go a little bit deeper in this and, and maybe you could advise because a lot of our listeners are living paycheck to paycheck now with inflation. And I've spoken to many, many, many people when we speak about financial goals in life and the savings and profit first model and stuff like that. It says, I'll gladly do it. You know, but if I make my calculation on a spreadsheet, I just don't have anything left. You know, I, I at one point I sat with a couple of young guys and I actually created the spreadsheet and then people started asking me for that spreadsheet and I actually put it up on our website for our listeners, www.ptexgroup.com slash budget, which is a blank Excel file to just plug in the numbers, see where you start off with. And you know what the responses, most of the responses were, it's not adding up. The inflation is so high and cost of living and tuition is not adding up. What are you telling for somebody like that? So I don't generally work with people like that. Um, through the work I do with Living Smarter Jewish, we have counselors that do that. You know, but in my years with Masila and now with Living Smarter Jewish, you know, the first thing is we have to figure out where your money's going, how much money you're earning and where your money's going. Uh, there are people who are literally not spending extra money. They're living paycheck to paycheck, but they're living paycheck to paycheck responsibly, not the living paycheck to paycheck with two car leases and vacation once or twice a year and eating out once a week or twice a week. If if you're if you're that kind of person, then of course you're living paycheck to paycheck, but you don't need to be living paycheck to paycheck. So if you're a person who doesn't eat out, doesn't take vacations, doesn't have two car leases, and you're still living paycheck to paycheck, well, there's only one solution. You have to gain more skills and improve that paycheck. And that comes to a conversation about what's your career? What are you doing? What, what's the upside in this career? I mean, realistically, as your family grows and as expenses grow, how are you going to continue to outpace inflation and the cost of living that's going to go up, plus save for retirement? The time to do that is when you're younger, when you're more malleable, when you can learn new skills, when you can change careers, you know, when people come to me in their 40s and 50s and they've kind of, you know, hit a ceiling, there's not that much I can do for them because the time to change was many, many years ago. So, again, you have to think forward. People take jobs and they hope for raises. They have children, but they don't actually plan that one day there's no way in the world this job is going to provide me with the with the level of increases that I'm going to need to continue to spend what I spend, plus inflation, plus all the other expenses that come on later in life. So, you know, sometimes it's comfortable to take a, a salary job because you know you're getting a paycheck at the end of the month. But there again, the comfort of today may me much may lead to much greater discomfort in the future. What I will just add to it, and this is um, this is very helpful, but a lot of people. They, they asked me like, why should I even create a budget? Why should I even understand where my expenses are going? It doesn't add up. I always tell them, let me ask you a question. I tell them like, if, if you make the, the calculation and you see what you off with $7,000 a year. Now, now you know, I could, what could I do in my, my job? What could I do? What could I add value to not go to your boss, ask for a raise because your cost of living is $7,000 or more. Think for a moment and say, what type of task could I also take over yeah. and bring more value? And now you know the, where the gap is. It's important because if you don't know the gap, you're, you're just, uh, you know, on a cycle all year long and you're just not catching up. So the, the worst thing for a person in that situation is not to know because not knowing leads to despair and despair leads to recklessness. You know, if somebody knows that they're they're a mess, they're a total mess, there's no hope here anyway. So what's the difference? It's like somebody who hasn't cleaned up their house in six years, their house reeks, it's disgusting, and they're eating a banana. Of course, they're going to throw the banana peels on the floor. What difference does it make? Right? And that's the way people think about expenses. They're like, oh, what's another $500? What's another swipe of the credit card? My, my life is a disaster anyway. But once somebody shows them that once there's a name to the problem, there's a number to the problem. Okay, so we know what it is. Now we can start planning. Now now you don't want that number to get bigger, right? Let's think how we can chip away. And once you start chipping away at that problem, you're even more even more motivated not to make the problem worse. So when I was in Masila, we, we found that awareness of the problem and the number was a great motivator for people. 
it's just an excuse, Manny. People are looking for excuses not to be disciplined. And, you know, they'll find every excuse in the world and hopelessness. And I'm a lost case anyway, and it'll never add up. And what's the point? And my life's a disaster is the best excuse to do absolutely nothing. Got it. Let me ask you um, a, a topic which is a little bit, could be it's a little controversial or it's not a topic that's discussed enough. So let's say, let's on the flip side, a person is earning a nice money, he's making money, and now it's sitting in the bank, he wants to do something. Mm-hmm. And I, I know we have, you know, I've passed on some some leads to you in terms of, obviously, um, there's a threshold for that, but I think you passed it on to other people that could work alongside it for when it comes to investment. And we've seen way too many investments that are, are gone, let me use the word Ponzi scheme, or just not, not you know, maybe the facts weren't weren't as straight. I want you to share a little bit about, obviously, you know a lot about this space. What, what are the things when somebody wants to invest, walk us through the thought process of a passive investor, aggressive investor, more, you know, a little bit on the, on the, give it a little bit of knowledge on that space, because I think it's so important and we see so many horror stories when it's too late in the process. Right. All right. So the horror stories come to me all the time. They're, they're just very disheartening. Um, uh, you, you always think that this will be the last horror story and that everybody will learn their lesson, but unfortunately that's not the case. So there's two, there's two things that lead to horror stories. The nicer one is ignorance. Okay. Just plain ignorance. I don't know what I'm doing. I trusted this person. I gave them my money and they turned out to be a fraud or they turned out to be taking risks that I never thought of. So the first thing I say to that is you, you cannot be ignorant. If you're giving somebody your money, you cannot be ignorant. You have to know exactly what this person is doing. You have to understand the risks. And if you can't do that, don't invest and find somebody that's smart and intelligent and knowledgeable to either walk you through that investment or give you something that you can understand. Uh, I'm a big, big uh, proponent of Warren Buffett. I follow him. I read him. I invest a lot in his company. You know, Warren Buffett always says, if I can't understand the business model on a napkin, I won't invest in it. So I, I tell this to people all the time, don't invest in things you don't understand. Just walk away. The second one is greed. Greed is really what bothers me. So, you know, people, people are looking for get rich quick schemes. They're looking for ways to make outsized returns. And everybody seems to believe that there's got to be something out there that offers some kind of return. I, I hear people using words that if I use them, I'd be in jail, such as guaranteed returns or no risk. I've even seen this on documents that people have given to potential investors for all kinds of investments. This investment is, has guaranteed double digit returns with no risk. Now in Wall Street, the, both of those words, guaranteed and no risk, are absolutely illegal, and they could never make their way on a document. But when you get out of the regulated world of Wall Street, people say all kinds of things. So here's what I tell people. The first thing we look, want to understand when we're looking at an investment is what is the, what is the comparable risk-free benchmark? And the risk-free benchmark is the, is the treasury, right? So if the 10-year if the treasury is offering 4.6%, that is our benchmark rate. Now, stocks, which are riskier than the uh, 10-year treasury, obviously, but are moderately risky, meaning you're betting on the entire U.S. stock market, tend to return roughly um, 6% above inflation, so 8 to 10%. But let's use the number 9% just to keep it simple. So that basically double the treasury rate. And that would give you stock returns, okay? Now, somebody comes into my office and offers me 14% and tells me that this is less risky than the stock market. <laughs> so my question is to the guy, are you just a nice person? Because if you're less risky than the stock market, you should be offering me 8% or 7%. Why would you be offering me 14% with no risk? So without even opening up the brochure, I know he's full of it. 
the, so the, then the question is, there's a game called Where's Waldo, right? I go, where's Waldo? So where's the risk? Where's the risk? Now, just because there's risk doesn't mean I'm going to lose all my money. But I need to know where the risk is because otherwise I'm going in as an ignoramus, which I just said a minute ago I shouldn't do. So there's an expression, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. And that's true with all the investments I've ever seen that offer outsized returns. Now, coupled with the fact that you're probably talking to somebody who's unregulated, unaudited, unproven, right? So you're not you're not going into some edge fund that has a 25-year track record. You're not going into something that has SEC oversight and ASD oversight. You're going into Bernie Madoff or to somebody else, and maybe he's not a Ponzi scheme, but you cannot expect that this has been gone through with a fine tooth comb and unless they have some very high level sophisticated investors such as institutions and pension funds nobody really smart and knowledgeable has gone through this and made sure that it's what you say it is and this is all i hear all day long i went into this fund three years ago they promised me 12 to 14 percent returns they haven't made a payout in four years or two years or they did and now they stopped they send me the paperwork, I read it, and I go, what were you thinking when you went into it? So if you're ignorant, don't invest until somebody smartens you up or give your money to somebody reputable who will invest in publicly traded securities. If you are greedy, I guarantee you, you may make your first investment or your second one. At some point, your greed will catch up to you and you will lose. Don't let greed drive your decisions. Don't look for outsized returns. That's not the way people get wealthy. They get wealthy by not losing their money. Yeah, and, and the, the the problem that we're seeing a lot is it's happening um, you know, across all age, age gaps, so to speak. Like you can see young people do it and you can see also smart business people. But I think based on the two notes that you mentioned, the first part is if you can't understand it on a napkin. So sometimes you can see older investors, they made money in one type of business and they're like, they don't understand it, but they trust that person for that moment. Or maybe there was an introduction by a person that they trusted. And the second part is, is, is on the, on the, on the greed is, is sometimes you see young, young people that just made a, a, a ton of money and they're trying to double that or triple that or ten, tenfold that. So you're a strong believer, I guess, in, in, in secured investment, um, long term. Yes. Because if you're a passive investor, which is what we're talking about here, then you're on the outside and you have to, take as many safeguards as you can to make sure that your money is safe and protected. If you're an active investor, if you're going into real estate yourself or you're going into businesses yourself, that's a very different story. But most people that you just described are looking for some way to passively increase their money and there they have to be really, really careful. The other thing you, you alluded to, which is important to note, is that affinity fraud is usually behind these. I know the guy, I pray with him, I know his brother-in-law, you know, how could somebody I know or, or somebody that somebody I know knows somehow hurt me? Well, that's where most people get hurt. They, because that's where they drop their guard and they don't do the proper due diligence. They don't ask the right questions. They're almost ashamed to ask the right questions because that seems like I don't trust you. But that's not the reality. When you put your money to work with somebody, you have to be able to ask them every question. You have to be able to call references. You have to know who you're doing business with. Just because you know the guy personally doesn't mean you should trust them with your money. Beautiful. I want to I wanna turn to another very important topic. And I know that uh, it's you have a very, you know, big passion to it and which is called personal development. I think uh, when we first met, we were speaking more on the sales side of things and getting a person up to their, up their game, so to speak, in their skills. On this podcast, we're speaking a lot about personal development and, and even though it's a, it's a, it's a business podcast, but there's a, a famous quote from Dave Ramsey that an a organization will never outgrow its leader. Which means is if, the, if there's no personal development on the leader perspective, at one point the business will will, will stop growing. Uh, but we're talking to everyday people, people that are just listening to the show. 
there needs to be a structure of, of where do you want to go from a, from a personal development perspective. And everybody, I, I believe that everybody listening to the show had not reached their fullest potential. Uh, one of the things that um, I've seen, and I want to hear your take on it, is a lot of people, what really um, puts them down is they try to measure their success against what they see maybe in their their neighbor, their community, in their shul, uh, and stuff like that. What would be your advice of separating what my potential is, where I could grow versus trying to compare myself to everybody around me? I really don't find much benefit in ever comparing people to each other. I think it's, it's a ridiculous way to live life, to look around and see what other people are doing and, you know, try to feel um, less or more about yourself as a result. Um, you know, these, these comparatives are just, they're ridiculous. On the other hand, people could spur you to growth because when you see people taking on projects or doing things that you never imagined they could do, it, it, it's intriguing. How did he do that? What made him do that? I get calls like that all the time. But I, when I authored that book, they said, I, we would have never thought you'd be an author. How did you do that? I just got two calls like that last week. Or, you know, how did you become a public speaker? Or how did you get into Wall Street? It spurs people to think more potentially about themselves. But that's not really a comparison. That's just seeing, wow, this person achieved a certain thing, and I would like to do that as well. The reason why it's ridiculous to compare, you know, people to each other is because we're, we're, we're just all very, very different. And we all have different circumstances. And the guy who you're jealous of because he may be earning more money has a terrible marriage. He, he doesn't spend any time with his wife and kids. Maybe he's a shark. Maybe he steps on people to get there. He, he, all you're looking at is the outside trappings of his success, but you don't really know, and you don't know what he's willing to do or not willing to do to reach that point. And I'm not saying that's all true, but I'm just saying that without all the information, it's, it's ridiculous to do that. I find it's just demoralizing. I, I find that I like to see what other people are doing because I want to see what, I'm, what what's potentially out there. But then I really have to look at myself and say, am I, make, am I maximizing all I can? Am I uh, bringing out all of my potential? And just because somebody else has a potential doesn't mean that I do. And just because somebody else does not have potential doesn't mean that I don't have that potential. So I, I really spend a lot of time focusing on the road in front of me instead of the lanes to my left and the lanes to my right. I really only glance there very rarely. And I'd say as I've matured, I almost don't glance there at all. I really don't look at what other people are doing, both inside of my profession and outside, in terms of success, in terms of where they've where they've gone. If I can learn something from them, I do. I think people should spend more time developing themselves, reading books, speaking to people that can teach them how to gain certain skills, and stop worrying about everybody else. So um, speaking about with, um, just continuing this, this part of the conversation, how does a person really know what their full potential is and knowing that they're in the right track even? They won't know until the day is over and that means their life. And even then they won't know what they could have become had they lived another 120 years. The famous book, The Chavis Olavav, The Duties of the Heart, writes a beautiful thing. And I, I, I'm going to use an example, which is, you know, something that I can visualize. So, you know, life is like a room and at the other end of the room, there's a wall. And from where you're standing, that wall seems impenetrable. It's, it's brick. And that seems to be your potential, right? That's a metaphor for your potential. And then your job is to run to that wall, to get to that wall. And when you get to that wall, that door, there's a door that opens up. To an entirely new room and in that new room there's another wall on the other side and then you have to get to that wall and then when you get there another door opens up and he says that you know that's because when a person exercises their exercises their right to grow and they they make a choice to grow when they get to the end of what they can perceive as their potential growth god opens up another door Hashem opens up the door and a new vista of potential opens it's not possible for a person to foresee what they're capable of. All they can see is what their next 
goal looks like. What's that wall that's in front of me that I can go to? And then I know that that door is going to open. That's the problem that people have. They look at people that have reached certain heights and they say, I could never reach there. Well, if you ask that person, they themselves would have told you that I didn't think I would reach this either. I never even dreamt of it. All I knew is I have to grow. And when I grew from A to B, all of a sudden C became possible and then D became possible. So I know to you, it looks like I was always potential to become a Y or a Z and reach the zenith of potential. But I can assure you when I was standing at A, all I saw was B. And I tell this to people all the time, you don't, you have no idea until you hit the B, hit B as to what C even looks like. So speak to anybody who is successful at anything, they will all tell you, I could have never envisioned this. That's how people sell themselves short. So what would you say um, to somebody that's in the in their life journey, so to speak, and they want to grow themselves? What is so obviously you mentioned the, the you know the Chav Sabovas and, and the story of, of of those rooms, which is a visual um, way of looking at things. But if they want to create goals for themselves on personal development, what would be those? The, the, you know, where would you tell a, a young professional to look to see where their improvements could be from a personal perspective and even a, on a professional perspective? So the personal and professional, I really wanted the same to me. Yeah. Personal development means knowing, first of all, being honest with yourself about what your weaknesses are. What, we don't use that word anymore. It's not politically correct. Your areas of development are, <laughs> okay? So if you are, if you have an issue with time management, if you are sloppy, if, you're, if you find that you can't keep your word, if you have an issue um, listening to people, if you have issues building rapport, whatever area you know, I always tell my kids, if there was a pill that you would pay money to buy and take that would change something about yourself, then you can pretty much be sure that's an area of development. So if, if somebody comes into business... Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So for our listeners, take two minutes and say, we're giving this pill for free. Which pill do you want to choose? Exactly. That's the area of development. <laughs> what would you want to swallow and change about yourself? This and that's so not about your bank account. It's not about how tall you are, whether you have blue eyes or brown eyes. It's something that matters to the success for the rest of your life. So good. So it might be self-esteem. It might be confidence. It might be communication skills. It might be all of the above. But you got to take one thing at a time. And you got to work on it because that's why you're here. You know, the Ritzadik HaKoyin says, the Sitka Satsadik writes, that if a person wants to know why they're here, well, they should find that area of development that's holding them back the most, and they can rest in short that's what it is. So personal development, to me, the most impactful ones are interpersonal skills, our skills that how we interact with people. Because in business, at the end of the day, reputation clients. It's all about people. It's all about your people skills, your your trustworthiness, your reliability. Everything that you do to generate business entails people. So, you know, are, are you a good communicator? Do you keep your word? Do you look for shortcuts? Are you disciplined? Are you exacting? Do you try to deliver is at a level of perfection? Are you just happy getting by? you know, skirting your way through. You know, somebody told me the other day, it, it, it was just astonishing. Um, they placed an order with a company on behalf of a client and uh, the order came in wrong. And the company asked, is the client unhappy or is it just you? <laughs> Meaning did the client notice? So they didn't care about whether or not their product was good or not. They just wanted to know at the end of the day if they were going to be asking for a refund. And like that, that just shows on what level this company is operating. Yeah, it's so true. And, and I think, I think when, when you find what the shortcomings are, uh, you're able to work one thing at a time. And when you see progress, that momentum is like contagious. 
It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And people don't realize it till they actually do it. And they say, wait a minute, I was here two months ago. I had this struggling with this issue again and again and again. I put my attention to it and all of a sudden I, I see progress. It's exactly what we said for budgeting. It, it, it's, it's motivating. Progress is motivating. Beautiful. So another topic, which is very important, and I see a lot of p people are struggling. But before I ask you the question, I'll just, I'll just ask you for your definition. What is your definition of true happiness? So happiness is a hard, is a hard word. <laughs> it doesn't even exist in our language, as you know. Um, I think we have moments of happiness. I think happiness is an outflow of other things. But, you know, I, I, I don't really spend a whole lot of time thinking about how happy I am or how happy I'm not. Um, some of my best days are days where I have zero happiness. I don't use that word a whole lot. What do you satisfy? Satisfaction? I use the word satisfaction. I even, a deeper word I think is fulfillment. Beautiful. So I really look at the word fulfillment. At the end of my life, if I had a fulfilling life, a meaningful life, that would be to me a wonderful life. A happy life, I, I guess, as an outflow of fulfillment and meaning, there would be a tremendous degree of happiness, but life's full of sadness. But sadness doesn't take away from meaningfulness. Um, sadness and meaningfulness could be one and the same. Sometimes some of the saddest things in life turn out to be extremely meaningful. So let's, let's talk about fulfillment. So how could a person achieve a fulfilled life? The first way that a person can achieve a fulfilled life is by living life as it was designed for them not trying to live life as it was designed for somebody else. So to live your own life, you're really only going to find fulfillment when you're living the life that was intended for you. And that's really what the word fulfill is. It's achieving your purpose and being here. There are universal things that are universal for all human beings and all humankind that bring fulfillment to everybody or should bring fulfillment to everybody. And things like giving to others and helping others and building the world around us and making the world a better place are things that are really synonymous with being human. But over and above that, there are going to be things that are unique to the individual that we're talking about. So given the skill sets that God has endowed you with, Hashem has given you, um, you're going to find fulfillment expressing those things first recognizing them, bringing them forth, and then actually utilizing them. So take somebody who has a beautiful voice, right? Um, but he's, he's shy, he's afraid, he, he, he has stage fright. And, uh, you know, this person can go through life and say, yes, I have a beautiful voice, but there's nothing I could do about it. Or they could say, no, if God gave me this and God endowed me with this beautiful gift, then I was meant to do something with it. And this person can overcome those challenges and ultimately, he'll find tremendous fulfillment in bringing forth that incredible talent that Hashem gave him or her. And that's true for all areas of life. A person that's living a fulfilled life feels that they are, number one, expressing to the point where they are today what they can in terms of their skill sets, and that they're developing new ones so that life isn't growing stale and that there's more to anticipate in the future. Where does gratitude come into the mix? Gratitude is, is, is it's extremely important. Gratitude is, so if you want to talk about happiness or satisfaction, it's literally impossible without gratitude. Because the definition of gratitude is that you recognize and appreciate what you have and what was given to you. People that have no gratitude don't have gratitude because they don't actually think they have anything or they belittle what they already have because they're so focused on what they don't yet have. So what's it to be great, grateful for? People that are not grateful to their spouses, people that are not grateful to their partners, people that are not grateful to their parents, basically are un unhappy with the situation today. So there's really no reason for them to say thank you. The first thing is you have to recognize what you already have. So if a person recognizes that they have achieved a certain level of success, and that level of success is, is, you know, something fulfilling and meaningful and important, then they should thank 
the, 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 the God, the Hashem that, that allowed this to happen, if they're not and they have no gratitude, it's probably because they don't think that they're in a good place and they don't appreciate where they are. So they're really synonymous. And the more a person derives pleasure and satisfaction from what they have, the more they want to feel, they feel they want to give back to those that help them get there. The more people feel shortchanged and, and unfulfilled, the less they have to have gratitude for. I want to ask you a follow-up question to gratitude because I, I know a lot of people wrestle with this, um, what I'm just about to say, which is you could look at somebody that um, you know has kids, has a family, and then their neighbor is struggling with this issue. They don't have kids. So you could have gratitude of what you have, or you could have gratitude that I'm not suffering what my neighbor is going through and suffering. So I know it's a little deeper question than just regular um, gratitude, but how, how could you live a life in, and have the proper gratitude towards what you have, not to compare that maybe your neighbor doesn't even have that, but rather just living your life in your own four worlds? So it's interesting, rather, Vigna Miller writes about this, um, and he says that it's really the former is important. I mean, when you walk down the street on your two legs and you see somebody in a wheelchair, the first thing you need to do is feel sorrowful for that person, and then you need to have gratitude for your legs. Sometimes, you know, we, we grow accustomed to things and we take things for granted. That's just natural. It's natural for people to take things for granted. And sometimes we have these reminders. So it might be your next door neighbor, and it might be the person on the street who reminds you that you have legs, who reminds you that you have children, and then you immediately feel gratitude that you have children. Now, there's all kinds of reasons to, be, to have gratitude that you have children, even without somebody else not having children. The problem is, you just assume that having children is just like having legs. It's, it's a normal part of life. We sometimes need that next door neighbor to be the wake up call that we can actually stop and recognize what our children are actually, how additive they are to our life. And sometimes we need to, to look at the opposite. The, the Rebbe of Rashab of, of Chabad says that we only appreciate something. We only appreciate light when there's, a, a header when there's a, a, a an opposite when there's a lack of and th then we yearn for that light back a person that was born in a room that was always light doesn't yearn for it because it's status quo so it, it, it's really both if it was a given that something would always be the way it is and that it could never change it would be hard to continuously have gratitude so we need those reminders that things can change Last time we spoke, um, it's been a while. Uh, it was just about when the uh, when the book came out. You revealed a Torah path to life of success. Um, it's been a while since then. Let me let me just ask you, like, what were the like the highlights of the feedback you have gotten throughout the time? Which of the chapters and the concepts, or maybe share one or two of those of the concepts that really resonated with the people that, um, that read the book. So the book's been out now for. I'm thinking three years or two years. I don't even remember. Um, thank God it's going into, I think it's 12th printing. Wow. It's also been translated to Yiddish, as you know. Um, and the other thing I would tell you is it's also being rewritten right now for the secular world. So the book has sold thousands and thousands of copies to non-Jews. And I've received emails from people from around the world as far as uh, Paraguay, uh, South Korea. Um, so the book has really resonated with both Jews and non-Jews. It's being rewritten to just make it more user-friendly for somebody who doesn't understand, you know, Jewish words. I've heard from every single part of the book, I've gotten feedback. Um, I've gotten feedback from literally every single chapter. Some of the things that, that really resonated with people were what we just spoke about before. Um, you know, that people are capable of much more than they thought. Um, the book also has zero tolerance for excuses, for reasons to underachieve. 
I'm very vocal about that. I'm very hard on myself and I'm very hard on my reader in a nice way. I think that was a wake up call for a lot of people. The people felt that they were coddling themselves too much. They were wallowing in self pity too much and that they, um, they really had to stop being their own worst enemy. A lot of the techniques in the book people have told me have changed their lives. It changed the way they interact with their spouses. It changed the way they conduct business. And they really, really started thinking more about what they were doing and why they were doing it. And I think the most important thing is a lot of people have started learning more because of the book. I think that they really never appreciated how much wealth of information our Torah has and Bali Musser have. And, and a lot of people have taken up learning Chavis Halavavis and other works because they really want to take it a step further and delve deeper into self-development. So I'm in the process of writing my second book with the very little free time that I have. I'm also in the process of rewriting the first one, as I said, for the secular audiences. And I've been bombarded with emails over the years, people who have read the book, had questions, wanted, you know, more ideas and so on and so forth. So what is the, the, the second book all about? Second book is about self-esteem. Yeah. So important. So important because I, I believe that uh, people confuse um, self, um, self-esteem with ego and they don't understand that ego is something you check at the door and self-esteem is uh, something that you actually embrace because that pushes you forward. Based on your self-esteem, you, it really tells you, yes, you can. Yes, you can. And go on, go on, go on. And open that door to do more. You've probably found, as I have, that most people that have egos don't have self-esteem. Oh, yeah. And they, that's the, the difference between the public persona and the behind-the-closed-doors persona. Exactly. Have you ever imagined when you wrote the first book um, that it will have this type of an impact? I wondered if anybody would read it. Wow. I knew that the information was impactful because it worked for me and it's Torah. I just didn't know if people would find the book too overwhelming. It, it's not an easy read book. It's not a book you, you know, you sip a latte with your feet up. Most people that have written to me and people that I meet on the street tell me they've, they've read the book at least once or twice with a highlighter and they're, they're going to, they continuously reread the book. It's a demanding book. It's a demanding book. It's it, when I wrote it, I could have written five books out of that one book. I've read books like that, you know, where the entire book talks about just one thing like meaning or laziness. I can't stand such books. Just an excuse to write a 300 page book and repeat the same thing 400 times. So really, every one of these chapters could have been turned into a book. And people have turned them into curriculums in schools. They've expanded it more. I, I, I demand of the reader that they work. I demand of the reader that they, they really think about what I wrote, because I really try to not, not to write any extra words. Beautiful. Where could people find out more about you and about the book? I know that you get a ton of emails, but is there is there a place where you speak about the book or the concepts in the book? So there's an art scroll interview, which didn't have that much about the book. No, I think they should just go on to Amazon and read reviews. And buy the book. So the and book is the called book. You Reveal, The Torah Path to Life of Success. Um, we'll link it up in the resource mentioned in this episode. Check out the show notes at www.ptexgroup.com slash podcast, where you'll see a transcript of this of this interview and ultimately links to buy the book. Let's close with the four rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Sure. Number one, speaking about books, a book that changed your life. Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Number two, a piece of advice you got that you'll never forget. The piece of advice that I forgot that I'll never forget is that sell yourself, but don't do that by bashing the competition. Beautiful. Number three, anything you wish you could go, you could go back and do differently. Yes, I wish I would have believed in myself much earlier. I wish I would have had a bigger vision for myself much earlier. Um, I probably wasted half of my 20s, maybe even more than half of my 20s, just, you know, underselling myself. And, you know, if I could do it all over again, which of course I could, I basically want to be wiser, younger. 
Wow. Usually this is rapid fire questions that I don't interrupt, but this, I need to interrupt for our listeners to make, take note on this because listeners believe in yourself because, and don't be your worst enemy. If you believe in yourself, the sky is the limit. You could really change the world. If you're not going to change the world, at least change yourself and the world will change around you. Last right. final question. What's still in your bucket list to achieve? Write another book without a question. And I want to start at least one, if not two organizations when I am retired. And I'm sure by the time I get there, there will be more than that. But without a question, I want to spend much more time helping young people achieve self-development and create curriculums and programs for that to happen. Beautiful. Afoli, thank you so much for joining us. I know your time is valuable. That's why in the name of our listeners will forever be grateful for sharing some of your time with us today. Thank you. Take care. And that's a wrap for today's episode of the Let's Look Business podcast. I hope you enjoyed the practical, no-nonsense advice that our guests shared. If you found value in listening, I would be so grateful if you could share the episode with your friends. And if you could give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever platform you listen. Subscribe to the show and get notified every time we publish a new episode. The Let's Talk Business Podcast is a P-Tex Group original production. Until next time, make it a great day.